Thanks everyone for joining us. We're gonna get started in about 60 seconds right at the top of the hour. I wanna maximize our whole time. So hang tight and we'll be back in a minute. All right. Welcome, everybody. Greetings from rainy San Francisco. Thanks for joining us for our webinar today, uh, all about the data protection officer and everything you need to know. Uh, my name is Luke Tucker. I'm editor of Zero Daily here at HackerOne and uh, do all things content and community. Uh, really excited to welcome our guest and presenter today, Deborah. Uh, I'm going to just literally hand it right to you, Deborah, and we're going to get rolling. I want to maximize our time. We've had a lot of interest in this topic, a lot of conversations, both internally and with associates. So. Uh, I'll just hand it over to you and really excited to get rolling. Well, thank you so much, Luke, and, and to HackerOne for help, you know, putting this event together and, um, you know, giving me this platform today. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about the, the role of the data protection officer under the GDPR and pretty much everything you need to know. Um, I say everything you need to know, however, things are changing. Each of the 28 member states are able to give additional responsibilities or requirements around the data protection officer so it's important to set the stage that i'm really discussing what the gdpr itself uh lays out about the dpo role <clears throat> and uh so first a little bit about me which will be on the next slide well i, I was gonna <laughs> i'm not controlling the slide so a little bit about me i was going to first start with cranium uh i've recently joined cranium which is a global privacy and security uh, consulting firm. We do most things soup to nuts, except for your really, really uh, technical implementations of, uh, you know, of different tech or uh, a pen testing uh, or even bug, you know, bug bounty programs. We do not do. Uh, we do most other areas of compliance around privacy and security. Uh, we're headquartered in Brussels and uh, have offices in the Netherlands, Hungary, and, and the United States as well. Um, and I'm, I'm calling in today from our San Francisco office. Um, so who am I personally? Uh, I, I just have such a large uh, background in privacy over 14 years in this space. So I'm not gonna read everything out loud, but the first five bullet points should be where I am right now, right? I'm a consultant and non-practicing attorney. Uh, I operationalize privacy and security into businesses. So um, do a lot less on the legal side. Uh, I'm currently the executive consultant and chief privacy officer of Cranium, uh, and uh, I'm an advisor to uh, the tech startup uh, and privacy startup Big ID. Um, also, currently on two advisory boards: the IEEE Personal Data Privacy Working Group, as well as the IAPP's Certified Information Privacy Technologist or CIPT Exam Development Advisory Board. Um, I guess we could go to the next slide. Uh, and, and note that I've added a lot more in detail in these slides because we will be able to share these with you afterwards, which is always a question we get. And because even though you're on this call and getting a lot of good information, I'm pretty convinced you're gonna wanna share this with somebody else in your organization or outside your organization. So I made sure to add enough detail that uh, would make sense. So just, I won't speak to everything on my slides, but for the agenda for today, um, we're going to just briefly give an overview of the GDPR, um, just to set the stage. When then we're going to discuss when an organization is required to hire, appoint, or contract with a data protection officer. Um, who, what that reporting line should look like, and how does that person remain independent as required by law? Who is able to serve in the DPO role? What are the actual tasks and responsibilities of the DPO? And then let's, you know, let's kind of unpack what's the difference between a CPO, a DPO, and a, and a CISO, right? It just, it, it sounds like we've got multiple executives there, but, you know, why, why, why not combine some of them and why do they need to be separated? And then we'll discuss right now, like, wh what it's like to try to hire for the DPO at this moment uh, and what some companies are doing. And then answer all your questions. So I'm sure you have plenty. I know this is a well-attended event. So next slide, please. 
All right. So <laughs> my my attempt is to just kind of discuss the GDPR by itself in just 60 seconds. All right, next slide. So uh, basically the GDPR came about because there, there currently there's law uh, data protection uh, directive. The general, uh, sorry, the data protection directive applies to the 28 member states of the EU and tells them that they have to implement local legislation to enshrine all the requirements of the, the directive. As a result, we've been dealing with a patchwork of 28, you know, similar laws that all have different requirements when dealing with the EU. So one of the main goals of GDPR is to unify all of the, uh, the requirements so that businesses only have to navigate through one major set of data protection and privacy requirements. Um, in addition, the, the general goals of, of data protection and privacy are to protect uh, EU uh, personal data, and that's the terminology used in the EU is personal data, not, not PII. Um, and so in this case, it says here EU citizens' personal data. I want to point out you don't have to be a citizen in order for GDPR to apply to you. You just have to be uh, in the EU while your personal information was collected. So this should say EU residents' personal data. Um, another goal is to provide a level of control over your own information as a data subject. Um, so the, the approach for EU data protection law is much more of a, a right to privacy, a, a uh, human right to privacy, as opposed to in the United States, we approach privacy from a more of a consumer protection perspective. And we only regulate in certain sectors or where we see a breakdown. Um, another goal is to unify the duties and responsibilities of the different uh, data controllers and processors. And then to simplify the meaning of data collection and processing, and you know, I, I already explained kind of harmonizing into one, think of it as federal versus state law um, that makes it easier to comply with. So by May 25th of 2018, all organizations that collect or process any personal data of EU residents must be compliant with the requirements of GDPR. And so if you're on this call, I know you're probably savvy enough to know uh, that one fact. Um, and so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, we're going to talk about DPOs today and really just focus this discussion on when, for GDPR compliance, a company is required to, uh, to hire a point or contract with a DPO. Uh, next slide. OK, so the GDPR act actually states that when you appoint a DPO, it's mandatory to do so in order to facilitate compliance with GDPR in the following three cases. You are a public authority or body or acting as one. So that, that's basically talking, you know, you, you're a, a government entity or you're one of those quasi entities, maybe like an Amtrak, um, and, and you're acting as a, in, you, you you're producing a service that a public authority would produce. Um, uh, your core activities consist of processing personal data on a large scale and which requires regular and systematic monitoring. So when looking at that particular one, that could be, it could be a one person company that just happens to have a lot of end users uh, and therefore data subjects that they're processing, you know, as part of the service, it's regular and systematic on a large scale. Um, it could be your HR data. You might not even really have much of a, an online business where you're uh, processing personal data for customer use. But if you've got employees all over the world and you're, you know, uh, you, you're, you're sharing EU data with like US systems or, or maybe it's being stored in India, or you would then be required to have a DPO because, uh, a, you know, regular and systematic monitoring on a large scale applies to HR data as much as it does to customer data. Uh, and then the last is your core activity consists of processing on a large scale special categories of data. And the GDPR sets out what those are. Uh, I'm not going to list them all, but they, they include biometric data, um, history of cr crimes, um, and some other areas of sensitive data. It does not actually include, uh, oh, it also includes health information. But oddly enough, it doesn't include financial information as a special category of data. So I urge you to look at 
uh, the GDPR for for specific definitions because it it will vary time to time from from how we define the same word in the in the United States. And what I want to point out here is um, as part of your questions later on, I I would not be able to answer your question as to whether your business is uh, you know requires a DPO under these circumstances, that would be interpreting law and applying it to your organization. I mean, I could give you my my guess, but I, I would urge you if you haven't had a, a lawyer actually weigh in on this, um, you could get their opinion and determine whether or not you need to appoint a DPO. Um, but uh, something I want to point out is even if you're not required to appoint one, you still may choose to appoint a DPO, uh, and we'll explain the responsibilities of the DPO a little later on, but one of them is to uh, interact with the various regulators, which are called the supervisory authorities. And uh, you might be of a nature, let's say you are doing something that's like new and maybe like testing the waters, maybe it's a new feature that you might wanna sell to Facebook or something, right? Like you, you, you might think you need someone there to kind of interact with the, the supervisory authorities so that uh, you have a direct line for feedback and questions and can implement that into the business and make sure you're not stepping over any boundaries that's going to get you uh, in trouble. So so I, we definitely do have clients that we work with at, at Cranium that we serve as their external DPO who uh, have chosen um, to appoint one even though it's they don't believe it's required under the law. Okay, next slide. So I'm not going to spend too much uh, time on this slide, but I found this online from a, a consultancy called the DPO Network Europe, and it's uh, you know, a nice little flow chart that says should your company appoint a data protection officer under the GDPR, and you could you know follow that through, and and it gives you some obvious guidance. It kind of just gives a visual to to the verbal part that I just spoke to, um, but we could move to the next slide. Okay, so one of the requirements under GDPR is that the DPO must remain independent and, and, and they need to remain independent and, and avoid any sorts of conflicts of interest. So now that, that might sound like, okay, yeah, that makes sense at first glance, but I really want to stress what this means before we go to the next slide. Um, we've really never seen anything like this in the United States. What the DPO role really in effect is, is instead of having all of the regulators try to, you know, go to every business and say, you know, how are you doing? How's the business doing? It's the DPO is almost like embedding a regulator in your organization. Um, they can tattletale on you. Um, they should when when you are uh, not complying and you're, or if you're 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 saying if if you're not taking the steps you need to do to respect the rights of individuals, um, and so. Uh, I, I really want you to think of this as more as somebody who is going to be uh, overseeing the work that the privacy officer and the security office, office are putting together, is going to be reporting maybe to the board um, how, how the health of privacy and security and um, respecting data, data rights are. Um, so before, the, you know, I just wanted to set that stage before we go to the next slide, but I think uh, Luke, if you can flip the slides. Great. So let's first talk about what it means to be independent. A DBO cannot hold a position within the organization that leads them to determine the purposes and the means of the processing of personal data or that otherwise creates a conflict. So I want to unpack this for you. Um, the, the, the point here is that it is the business itself that determines how like why they're collecting personal data in the first place and then how they're going to collect it, store it, share it. Like what is the processing literally means anything that you do to the data. How do you view it? How do you, how do you share it? How, you know, all, all of the processes around the data and how it's kept. So if you're determining the purposes and the means of the processing of personal data, then you can't really be the one that's over that, that is um, kind of auditing so to speak, the purposes and the means of the processing. So this is why your chief privacy officer cannot also be your DPO. Um, any, and, and very often your, C, your CISO most likely would not be the right choice either because they're also opining on how data is collected, shared, stored, used from a security perspective. So 
um, you know, what data controllers or processors should do. And those are your the organizations. So the controllers would be those who control, uh, you know, how the data is, you know, collect what data is collected. And the processors pretty much are your vendors that are processing data on your behalf or your partners. Um, so in this case, data controllers and processors should identify positions which would be incompatible with the DPO function within your organization based on how your organization is set up. Draw up some internal rules to avoid conflicts of interest. And these are, this is should, this is, this is just recommendations to you. This is not like the letter of the law in GDPR here. I suggest you formally declare via internal and external communications and embedded in a policy documentation that the data protection officer has no conflicts of interest with regard to the function uh, as a DPO. And, and this helps raise awareness that this is a requirement for the role so they don't try to have others influence them. Uh, I'd also include safeguards within the organization's internal rules and ensure that uh, the publicly posted data protection officer job description or the services contract for the external DPO is precise enough and detailed enough in order to avoid any conflict of interest. And so I'm not saying that your chief compliance officer cannot be uh, a DPO, but I'm saying may, go through this thought process of how in your organization um, work gets done and decisions get made. Uh, and so on this left-hand side, I'm saying you're more likely to be be considered independent from the business if you're on the chief compliance officer's team or the audit internal audit team if you reported directly to a c-level uh if you have uh if you're an external contractor uh like someone like cranium or another uh, a law firm or a consultancy that serves as your external dpo uh who who reports to a c-level officer of the board or another reporting line that doesn't have a conflict of interest. You're more likely to have one if you're the chief privacy officer, chief security officer, CIO, right? I mean, you, you, the CIO wants the information for certain purposes. They're, the, they're probably the most, I wouldn't say offenders, but most conflicted. Uh, and then the privacy and security officer are advising on how that data is getting collected and, and, uh, and processed. Uh, anybody in the business like marketers or HR our, uh, managers or the product team, uh, probably also a conflicted area to put a DPO um, just because of the nature of they're within the business and that business has an agenda. Uh, the whole purpose of the DPO is to really watch the, you know, watch the watchers, like audit the, <laughs> audit the uh, those who are putting in the processes and procedures. And the, any also mo mostly a conflict of interest is where there's a reporting line up to business de executives who determine any purpose and means of processing. Uh, next slide. So, when you what are your obligations when you have a DPO? You know, so often I've been appointed like chief privacy officer or the first privacy director in a company, and it's like great, we have a person now we're done. <laughs> Uh, no, you need to support the, the you need to support the DPO. Your organization is ultimately responsible for compliance with GDPR, not your DPO, and they, and you must be able to demonstrate that compliance, not the DPO. You have to demonstrate the compliance to the DPO. So, uh, the Article Twenty Nine Working Party uh, uh, in the EU has called out the following activities as necessary for an organization to properly support its data protection officer. Right, so. You have to actively support them via management at, from a board level, uh, C level, right? You need that that um, executive sponsorship to make it known that this is this is important. Privacy is important. The rights of of uh, data subjects is essential, and uh, you know the executives need to to really reinforce that consistently. You need to allow the DPO sufficient time to fulfill their duties. So you don't want to bring on a part time person for you know five hours a month and and then they say that you know get annoyed that they can't get their work done in that time right so you want to make sure they have sufficient time and access to 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 get their duties performed uh you want financial infrastructure and staff resources available to the dpo um you need official communication that there is a dpo appointment to all of your employees uh it's always about notice and transparency with the eu and privacy right uh, then access to stakeholders such as the you know 
HR, legal, IT, and security folks that can answer all the questions and provide documentation to the, um, the DPO. Uh, and then continuous training, uh, and this is training of your DPO. So this is allowing them, uh, so especially if you're hiring someone internally, providing them with um, continued training as this field is evolving and the rules are going to be changing. So uh, it's, you know, you can't just take a course, learn how to be a DPO, and then just like never read a thing again. Uh, the DPO is someone who needs to be really actively involved in understanding the change of the landscape and responding and, and, and then relaying to the business what it learns so that the business can respond to those changes. Um, and then of course a DPO team, depending on the size and structure of the organization. If you're a Fortune 500 company, there's probably no way you're gonna be able to do this all on your own. However, if you're a startup, you know, you might not even want a DPO there full time because there's not necessarily enough work for them to do a full time job. So we'll talk about that a little later. <clears throat> but this is really flexible depending on the size of your organization. What's important to know is that as an organization that the employer is not allowed to instruct the DPO on how to deal with the matter, uh, what result should be achieved, how to investigate a complaint, or whether to consult the supervisory authority on something. Uh, you also can instruct the DPO to take a certain view of, a, of an issue related to a data protection law or follow a particular legal interpretation. So when we say independent, we really mean independent. <clears throat> I mean, it's like appointing a special prosecutor here in the United States, right? I mean, the, you, they're, 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 you cannot, you, ha you have no authority <clears throat> to fire your data protection officer because you do not like the results that they, of, of their assessment, if they tell you you're not compliant. Uh, and so this is something like we've never seen before in the United States, which is why I thought it would be really fun to put together a presentation on this. Um, also, might might mention now that while a DPO is new to us in the United States, the concept has been around in Europe for quite some time. Uh, Germany requires, I believe it's all businesses that have over 10 employees, but I could be wrong on that, to have a DPO. Uh, and France, I believe France allows uh, allows you to have a DPO, but it's not required. So there, there's, there's been, for decades, a, a DPO has existed. It's just a different form now that Germany had to negotiate with all the other uh, nation states uh, that form the EU to determine what the rules should be. And, and some of the, the DPO survived, uh, the, it made it into GDPR, but it's uh, some of the requirements are, and what triggers having a DPO are different. Um, so uh, there is a lot of literature out there on, on enforcements and how the, the regulators have been working with DPOs. Uh, and I urge you to take a look at some of that in Germany. I, I don't have specific resources to point you to, but um, if you wanna go down the rabbit hole, there's plenty there. <laughs> um, okay, next slide. So who can serve in the DPO role? Next slide. All right, first let's look at this cartoon because I found this and I just thought it was really funny. So we've got uh, this IT guy, you know, long hair. Um, he's, he's, uh, uh, his boss says, hey, we want you to be our DPO. And he says, cool, what's a DPO? It's a data protection officer. Great, I'll do it. I get, do I get a badge? And then it's him in the bottom panel, you know, before a supervisory authority uh, in the EU and going, oh, my God, WTF was I thinking when I said yes. Right. So it's, <laughs> you, you know, it's kind of, you can't just appoint anyone. Right. Uh, just just like, oh, no, we have a requirement. Let's just make Sally in accounting, you know, uh, uh, the, the data protection officer. No, this person has to have a certain a certain background uh, and a certain set of experience, professional qualities and expertise. Um, so while the GDPR itself doesn't give specific credentials, uh, a, a D, you are expected to have a DPO that has a certain set of expertise and skills. And I do want to mention that there will, in the future, there will be a certification uh, most likely to, uh, to become a DPO, just there haven't been any approved yet. Um, there are some great courses out there and there's some really mediocre courses out there that can uh, you know, teach you to become a DPO. Um, Cranium has one through Cranium Campus. We, we, we do have a course called uh, 
training to become a future DPO. Um, and so if that's something you're interested, feel free to reach out. There's also some other great ones out there, but I just be wary and look at the substance of a course if you're planning to take one, because um, there are a lot of fly by night firms out there. All of a sudden GDPR is big business. So, so just check how long how the expertise of the people uh, running the courses. But anyway, so let's dive into the expertise and skill. Um, it's essential that the data protection officer understand how to build, implement, and manage data protection programs. The more complex or high risk the data processing activities are, the greater expertise the DPO will need. So, you know, if you just need someone to handle the general documentation, um, I'm not saying this is all easy to set up the processes and all, but someone who's read GDPR and, and now feels that they know it well, but doesn't understand operations or, or building programs, that's going to be you know, less of a, a an expert, uh, because the whole point here is to, we've got a big change management process on our hands with GDPR. We need someone who understands operations and how to embed that in the business to, to effectuate change. So, you know, level of expertise doesn't necessarily have to be just in data production. It also should be included in, you know, operations and understanding business processes and how to move the needle on on those areas. Um, and then professional qualities. I want to stress that data protection officers do not need to be lawyers. In fact, in order to solve the, the problem of not having enough data protection officers out there, we're going to need to embrace a lot of non-lawyers. However, they do need to have expertise in uh, different member states, so the national laws and European data protection law, which includes an in-depth knowledge of GDPR. Uh, and, and how it's changed in all the various flavors of, um, you know, additional requirements from the nation state, uh, sorry, the member states. The DPOs must also have a reasonable understanding of the organization's technical and organizational structure and be familiar with information technology and data security, right? So we're asking for a pretty broad uh, skill set here in, in data governance, privacy, security, and the and and, for, and effectually. Uh, respecting the rights of uh, the data subjects. And then in the case for public authorities or bodies, uh, so basically the public sector, the DPO should have sound knowledge of administrative rules and procedures, right? Because it's just a different world when it comes to government, different set of laws around privacy and security as well. Um, okay, next slide. All right, let's get into the DPO's responsibilities. Next. So according to the G GDPR, the DPO must perform the following tasks, monitor compliance, inform and advise, coordinate with the supervisory authority, and serve as privacy contact. So <clears throat> for monitoring compliance, we're talking, you know, collect information to identify and analyze the processing activities. Uh, and when I mean information, I don't mean personal information. I mean internal documentation, all of the, you know, uh, maybe doing some, some, some interviews with uh, various stakeholders, but, but generally collecting the information necessary to identify and analyze processing activities, then analyze and check the compliance of those processing activities, conduct audits to ensure that GDPR compliance uh, is, is there and that you've addressed any potential issues appropriately with the right controls. Inform and advise. So this would be really serving as, as kind of an internal uh, consultants, right? So you inform, advise, and issue recommendations on data handling to the controller or the processor. So you can do this to your um, uh, your client, which is it could be the controller, but also to their uh, their vendors based on what you believe you know it, it, it is the right um, approach. So and and your your, your advice is also going to be based on the data protection impact assessments or the DPIAs that the organization, typically led by the privacy officers uh, suite, uh, but that the, that the DPIAs that have been performed. And so you've assess, they've already assessed the risk and after looking at that, you can then make additional recommendations to the organization. Also, inform and advise, you educate the company and employees on GDPR obligations and other data protection requirements. And then, very importantly, you can use your DPO to be one of the main trainers of the organization on, on privacy and data handling. Um, 
that's an area that we're really seeing because your, D, your DPO can perform other duties within the organization and only be a DPO part of the time as long as there's no conflict of interest. So that's, this person could also, you know, be the like key person who's doing data privacy and security training for your organization uh, at an executive level and a role-based level. Um, also, the next thing is coordinating with the supervisory authority. So the SAs, uh, you know, you, they might come to your organization and say, we need to see your records available right now. Uh, they will come to your DPO, and then your DPO has to turn to the business and get them, be able to have easy access to them. So of course, you want the business to be able to provide them easily, but the DPO coordinates with the SA. And you can also reach out to the SA if you have questions about, you know, is this, this looks like it's a gray area, what is your perspective on this? And basically be the expert that gets the answer from the regulator for, for your organization. And then also, if you have a data breach or a security breach, because a security, a breach of, a breach of security that in US law does not arise to a data breach is still considered a reportable breach under GDPR. And you have 72 hours to respond. So that's a whole nother, you know, issue that I'm not gonna really like dive into right now, but that would be an example where you would have to proactively be part of the incident response team um, and know to report these issues with data processing to the supervisory authority and know that your DPO is obligated to do that, even if the company said no, right? Um, so then serve as a privacy contact. Serve as single point of contact for data subject inquiries. Uh, so that if somebody said, hey, wait a minute, my information's incorrect, I really want to fix it, nothing's getting done, they, you have to you know, provide the DPO's information for them to be able to reach out and make that complaint. Um, and then also provide information on data subjects' rights related to the organization's data protection practices, uh, withdrawal of consent, the right to be forgotten, uh, and other rights. I mean, there's, there's about six rights, uh, six new rights under uh, GDPR. Okay, next slide. Okay, so like I said, in, this is a, you need to support the DPO in order to set them up for success. So what's important is that you have effective governance, right? You have to communicate to personnel the, uh, the appointment of the DPO and her functions, ensure that they have the uh, independence in the performance of the role, ensure that a direct reporting line is to the highest management level of the company, involve the DPO at the earliest stage possible in all issues relating to privacy and data protection. Um, you don't have to have a chief privacy officer if you don't have one already, but if you do have a chief privacy officer that's really embedded in the business, wherever a CPO would be, you would also want to invite your DPO typically. Also invite the DPO to participate in senior management meetings to represent privacy and data protection interests. Um, the next is uh, that there needs to be enough resources and training. So provide sufficient time and resources. So we're talking financial, infrastructure, equipment, training, staff. I'm going to go technical tools even because uh, there's a bunch of tools popping up for GDPR compliance too uh, that helps you automate and keep track of all of your uh, your documentation requirements. So, uh, so anyway, so, so pr provide su sufficient resources and time necessary for the DPO to keep up to date with data privacy and security developments and to carry out the tasks effectively and efficiently. And then of course, appropriate access. You need to provide access to personal data that the organization processes, including access to the systems, um, promptly, you know, consult the DPO in the event that a personal data breach or security incident happens. A DPO's opinion must be given due weight. You have to consider it. You can't not ask them and, and ask for forgiveness later. And if the business chooses not to follow the advice of the DPO, then the business needs to document the reason for that decision. Uh, so at a later date, if there is uh, either whether litigation over the issue or if it's just a regulator or enforcement, you are able to uh, you know, have a reasoned, you know, legal answer for wh why you did not follow the advice of the DPO. And it could be because there were two, maybe there were two rights conflicting against one another and you had to kind of pick which one, right? I, I don't know. I'm, th I'm just thinking up, you know, potential scenarios, but you, you need to document at least why you, you chose your decision. And then other functions, the 
the DPO, like I said before, can perform other tasks and duties as long as they don't create conflict of interest. Uh, they can train the board, execs, and employees. That's, a, that's one I'm seeing a lot of. Uh, and then they have job security. Just pointing that out to you, it's not really a function. But the GDPR expressly prevents dismissal or penalty of the data protection officer for performance of tasks, and, uh, and there's no limitation on the length of the tenure. So um, that person could be around a long time if they decide not to leave. Uh, of course, you can fire someone for cause. You can you can fire your external consultant, of course, but you can't you can't fire them if you just don't like the advice. So be careful who you bring on, and who you appoint as your GPO. Next slide. Okay, I will not be reading anything on here. I am just letting you know that I'm providing this uh, as a DPO job description uh, sample. Maybe not example, I should say sample. Um, this is just a, a, a good example of what you, of the qualities and expertise you should be looking at to fill the role, uh, whether in-house or uh, outside, you know, using a, a consultancy or a law firm. Um, the tasks that, the, how you would message the tasks of the DPO. Um, and, uh, you know, I put this here just so that, you know, a lot of people have found this helpful and um, you feel free to reuse this in your own uh, job search needs. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Okay, and I was so happy when I found this picture <laughs> of alphabet soup that said help because that's that's kind of how I think a, a lot of people are feeling uh, around the G topic of GDPR. But um, the next slide I'm going to be talking about is not a true comparison of like, what does a CPO do? What does a DPO do? What does a CISO do? But assuming you have all three in your organization, what I want to, to, what I want to lay out is the roles and responsibilities of how they work together. And if we can, can go to the next slide. Great. So, you know, traditionally for the chief privacy officer they're, they're responsible for setting and implementing global data handling policies and rules and advising the business on the ways and means of processing and i added ways and means of processing in there just to make a point that very often there the cpo is is actually advising on how the the information um is is collected and used and, and stored and how it flows through the entire organization systems. So, and while I don't put that there for the CISO, it's kind of true for the CISO too, right? But they're responsible for securing global corporate infrastructure, applications, IP, and personal data. And, um, but if you look at the DPO, they're responsible for oversight of EU privacy, data protection, and security compliance. So the DPO is kind of auditing the CPO and CISO, right? It, not in all ways, but in some. Um, and so you, you know, this is just one major comparison. The second line down, I'd say that a traditional CPO is responsible for putting in place data protection by design and default, complete the DPIAs where processing of personal data poses a high risk, among many other tasks. I mean, I was, this is just a kind of a succinct thought experiment here to compare them. Um, if you move over on the second row to the traditional CISO, they need to support the CPO by answering security questions for the DPIAs. Uh, and then the DPO would advise the chief privacy officer on when a DPIA is necessary and the risk-based methodology, you know, which one to use or how to tweak it to make it better. Uh, and, and then they'll also review those risks that were identified by the DPIAs uh, to determine whether or not decisions made about it have, uh, are compliant or to, to make recommendations on putting the business on the path to compliance. Um, so again, like an internal consultant. So the third line down, we see uh, that the traditionally a CPO is, is responsible for the GDPR documentation, or, or I sh not traditionally, but now they're responsible for GDPR documentation. Uh, and it doesn't mean the CPO is doing it, it could be someone on their team, but you know that role is, is responsible ultimately. So the records of processing, the subject access requests, the DPIAs, you know, all the documentation policies. Whereas the, the CISO is responsible for implement, implementation of appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to risk, which is what it says in the GDPR. And then the DPO's role here is to advise the chief privacy officer and CISO on meeting GDPR documentation requirements, mitigating security controls where controls have been accurately carried out. 
And then last but not least, um, I'll go through this really quickly. I see that we you know, want to leave enough time for questions, but um, this chief privacy officer is responsible for implementing processes into the business that respect the rights of the data subject, like the right to access and rectification and portability and erasure, among others where the CISO is responsible for ensuring the security of the systems and transactions with respect to the rights of the data subjects and how we give them that information and making sure that the data is accurate and all of that good stuff. So the DPO's role here is to advise the organization on whether it is appropriately respecting the rights of the data subject overall. Um, and I put at the bottom here that the DPO may benefit from support from a DPO data protection office, like I said, if you're in a really large company or if you're in a large conglomerate that has many different brands and each brand, you know, each brand might have like a deputy data protection DPO and there's one ultimate DPO. There's different ways to structure that. Uh, and also the DPO may, may physically be located in another jurisdiction. It doesn't have to be in the same country as, as you are in the EU. And if you're not even in the EU, your DPO can be based in the United States. Um, there's a lot of factors in choosing when and why you'd want to do that, but just know that that is plausible. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the war for talent and how companies are staffing the DPO role. All right, this one's just one picture I created. <laughs> okay, but I have a lot to say about this. So the IAPP is the International Association of Privacy Professionals. For anyone who's not a privacy pro on this call, which I think is probably going to be most most people since we're talking to the hacker one community is that um is is the organization the trade organization for privacy around the world it's the largest one it's who i go to for all of my to plug in to know about uh all things uh happening in this space and they did a research study predicting based on all the requirements of when you would need to appoint a dpo predicting that we would need uh, you know we will need globally 28,000 dpos Minimal, minimal. Um, I've seen the number go as high as seven, 76 or 76,000, something like that. So a minimum number of DPOs. Um, we already were looking for more people for the private to serve the needs of other privacy roles. Uh, and now all of a sudden we need 28,000 people in this more audited, auditing style role in businesses. How do we do that? How do we get them all? How do we get tra people trained quick enough? How do we get them? into these positions. Um, there's a bunch of things that companies are doing. Uh, for small, smaller organizations uh, where there's minimal amount of daily work for a DPO, I mean, they have, maybe they have one product uh, that has pretty much understand that workflow. It's not gonna change much for a while, but they you know, process data. Um, they, they believe they need to appoint a DPO, right? So I'm seeing them just either assigned a small portion of somebody's job, uh, maybe they were a privacy manager before and they've been following this, uh, but and then they've given them training to train them up on how to be a DPO uh, and successfully be able to just do the work when needed. Um, for Cranium, we've got an external DPO service as do quite a few other organizations, law firms, and consultancies. So what we do is we'll have uh, you know, a minimum number of hours per month that will, um, will serve as your external DPO. You'll have someone committed to your, your business because the important thing is that person needs to understand how your business works, how the systems work, how the, how the data processes are set up for, for uh, protection of, of the data subjects' rights and, and to preserve privacy. So you really need to do get embedded with the company and know it very well, but you don't have to be sitting there all the time uh, on site and, and paying for, you know, being the DPO uh, if, if there aren't enough activities. Um, other ways I'm seeing uh, DPOs be appointed by, uh, like at kind of to the reporting to the board for large companies and, uh, uh, doing quarterly board reports. And so this is someone I would have a much more mature, much, I don't want to say mature, much more, um, like I'd say, like a decade long experience in, in privacy, someone who knows this inside and out, who's guiding a board, right, on, on uh, you know, what the company's doing well and what the company should improve to shore up its uh, data protection um, robustness. Uh, you know, if you're going to have someone who's reporting to the board uh, and doing quarterly reports on, on, on the health 
of the organization because they don't want 4% fines that, uh, that are possible under GDPR, um, then you're gonna be looking for a different set of skills, right? Uh, it's going to be different from someone who you're like, oh yeah, this person's you know a mid-level manager who could totally put together some processes, do the documentation, fill this role well. It's going to be a different person from who uh, you want to be, you know, interacting with your board, your execs, and um, and you can even do this as a team. You could have you you have one one data protection officer who's pretty senior, almost the C-level person themselves. And then maybe they have a few deputy DPOs or other people that report to them that help manage some of the day-to-day -day documentation and process requirements. Um, and then maybe even someone who's a, a security person, right? Yeah, it depends on the needs of the organization. You could have a group of people act as uh, in the function of a DPO. Doesn't have to only be one person. And so even consulting, companies and law firms are are doing the same thing. Uh, we'll say, hey, we've got security and privacy experts on staff of junior levels and senior levels, and, and then we'll create a, uh, a service, a DPO, external DPO service that works for your organization. So um, that's something to look into as well. And I think, I think the next slide, uh, yeah, I think that's it. That's my presentation for today. I'm hoping that you have some meaty questions. Uh, I'd love to answer whatever I can, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get back to you if there's any follow-ups. Maybe we'll do a blog post. But uh, I turn it over to you, uh, Luke. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, yes, we will take you up on the blog post offer. Just uh, put that out there live in front of all of our attendees. Uh, that Deborah <laughs> has agreed to do a follow-up blog post. Um, we did have some questions uh, coming through, and just as a reminder for folks, you can go to the Go to webinar toolbar on your right hand side of your screen should be and you can type in your question there uh, and we'll see that and i do have some questions to to kickstart us as well um, and i think when we were chatting before uh and talking about this webinar uh it <laughs> part of that alphabet soup was always an interesting one because the what is a data protection officer and there's like confusion about Data privacy officer. Why? Why do you think that is the case, and what is the kind of? Can you help us with that alphabet soup question? Sure. So a data privacy officer. I mean, you mean like a the term data privacy officer? Yeah. Like, what are the differences in those roles, and how are they understood both uh, you know across the Atlantic and the EU, EU as well as in the United States? Um, okay. So in the in the United so the United States approaches privacy for more of a uh, consumer protection perspective, right? It's not gonna regulate unless they see some sort of breakdown or potential for risk uh, to, to a certain uh, industry's data, right? We do it kind of sectorally and industry-wide. And so because in the United States, unlike security laws, or I should say security frameworks, we, we've got just a few frameworks to which we, they're not really laws, right? We've got standards that we all kind of certify to, we've got ISO, we've got like HIP, with a HIPAA, HIPAA security rule and like PCI, like right, you know, right. easy, it's kind of, I don't wanna say federal, it's global, it's a standard, it's easy. For privacy, we've got a patchwork of laws in the United States. I'm talking, there's probably, there's dozens and dozens and dozens, there's probably hundreds of privacy laws if you look at the local level too. Mm -hmm. um, look, we have 48 data breach, uh, protection laws that specifically are there just to codify PCI compliance. Um, forget about the, all the other data breach protection laws under like HIPAA and, um, and, and other regulations, right? So we have so many laws to contend with with privacy that we, we usually appoint a chief privacy officer to be able to deal with uh, that typically has some legal background um, but doesn't need to. Uh, to help deal with understanding the external landscape and then being able to create policy and and processes that make sure the data is aligned with how the end user uh, allowed or permitted their data to be used, right? So, mm -hmm. so we call that a chief privacy officer. In the EU, we've got two terms, privacy and data protection. And privacy means what we think it means here in the terms of data privacy. But data protection is more about the rights uh, afforded to the individuals around their data and it is expansive of privacy so things like i want my i want my to data portability is a right under G gdpr 
Uh, I want the right to be able to take all the data you have about me, hacker one, and uh, I want to move over to a competitor in this fictitious world. <laughs> and uh, I want to move over to a competitor. So I want you to download not only the data that you have about me that I gave you, but data that you've been able to append about me from other places, data you de you've derived about me from my behavior, all the data about me that you've collected, I want you to I want to be able to download that so that I can then take that to and upload it to my new provider. Uh, that is a right now under GDPR. This is a, and that's data protection. Um, and so data protection is really more about preserving the human rights uh, around data uh, as, uh, as, as personal data, I'm sorry, as, um, as Europeans view this as a human right. And so mm -hmm. data protection officer really is about preserving the rights uh, and almost being an ombudsman for the user, <laughs> for, for, for the data subject. Mm -hmm. um, basically the voice of the customer in, in this case, but not for product development purposes, for their human right purposes. Um, I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Yeah, I think so, for sure. Uh, we had uh, um, had some questions come in about that, so I wanted to kind of just have you uh, go through that, which is perfect. Um, let's see, we, had, we were talking beforehand about a Deloitte survey, I think this was last quarter, maybe November 2017, and some of those quotes I'll just uh, read there and get to the question. It's about 10% of data protection officers will have a seat on the board of their organization, and about 42% will sit one layer down. This is from this Deloitte survey. Uh, do you think that's enough, not enough? Are you surprised or, or what, what are your thoughts on some of those stats from Deloitte? Uh, I had not seen that study. I think that's a great study. Um, I think that the beginning and implementing of any law like this big is always chaotic. And I, I'm sur I, I wonder by when does it does it say is that by 2016 by 2020 by 2000 you know 2008 uh 20 yeah when when does it say that they predict that that's the case because i'm thinking 10 percent reporting to board sounds high that sounds like my mm. dream uh, <laughs> so what, what's I think the it was a state like as of you know the uh, respondents to the survey when they took it they said this is what we're seeing today that's what they're seeing okay mm -hmm. um i'm surprised I'm surprised. Yeah. I think that sounds high. Uh, most companies I deal with are still in the panicked mode of, oh my God, I just, my customers are asking for all these like requirements and contracts and stuff around GDPR. And I, 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 I didn't think it applied to us. And now I'm realizing it might. And like, what do we do? It's like a month, you know, we have like a month and a half to prepare for them. And, and, you know, so, so right now I'm seeing so much more freak out modes. I'm in the weeds with all the freak, the people freaking out that I'm trying to calm down and give a path forward to that. I have not uh, looked at so far ahead as to, you know, the, the, what the study does. Um, but that gives me hope that companies are thinking <laughs> because it really, it should be a hundred percent of the, of the DPO roles are reporting to a C, you know, a C level person or just below that, like it should be an executive, um, that is under the law or, or, you know, external, but even so if it's external, it should be still reporting into an internal executive. Um, but reporting to the board is I think optimal. Mm. Uh, we had a question come in from Keith. He was asking, within a small company, which role, in your opinion, would be most suited for the DPO? Would it be a chief privacy officer or CISO? Kind of comes back to that that table. You had some good good outlines there. And maybe the answer is uh, secret option C, neither. <laughs> but uh, yeah. what, that's his question. The option, yeah. is, the option is to really go through how their business works. And um, I would say it would be much harder to say this, the privacy officer could be it. Uh, I would probably be better under the security officer because security doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily determine the means and um, way, the ways and means of processing in the same way. I mean, you have less of that connection there, but I would go through that thought process at the beginning of the uh, presentation that and, and, and really take a look at what might consider it being a conflict of interest. And then um, you, you use your judgment. If you, if, you, if you feel that you could have your chief security officer um, be your DPO, which is possible, just it, it raised a little bit specter of impropriety there, but it, it, you know, delineate why. 
I would write it down and document why there is no conflict of interest and then preserve that and make sure that you don't ever blur those lines. And, um, and, and just make that clear to any of your, you know, if you're a vendor to another company, sh share with them that information or, you know, that'll be something you will share with your DPO, which is your CISO and, um, or get, get a third party, uh, a lawyer to kind of interpret for you. Mm -hmm. But I think, it, I think it's all gonna come down to how you justify, uh, that, how you document why you believe it's not a conflict of interest. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, we had a question from Kareem, and I, I'm not sure, I, maybe you can help me with the question a little bit. I think it's about how the role would, uh, you know, change, kind of about how you can't fire a DPO, but you can obviously fire for cause or different areas, but what is the process to change the DPO? Would that maybe, I think that's probably more a question about how do you go about going from an individual that you're looking for, uh, maybe to hire Deborah from Granium to be your DPO instead of somebody else and switch over. Is, is there any documentation there or process wise that you can speak to that you're aware of? I would have to say no. I'm not aware mm -hmm. of anything that speaks to that issue. Um, I'll tell you that. So there's firing because you don't like the, you know, because you don't like their, how they, you don't like their advice. But if you're like, you're not around or available when I need you, uh, it, it looks yeah. like too expensive. We need a cheaper option. You demand too high of a salary. Like you could, you could certainly negotiate, especially if it's a third party contractor. I'm sure it says something of the effect of like within 30 days, either party can end this contract, right? I would say it's a lot probably. Right, some boilerplate language that might be able to be advised with the legal department to just kind of yeah, I would work provide with some clarity there. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, question from David. So he is saying to what extent does the GDPR and especially the bits about data portability affect nonprofit organizations? Um, yes, very good question. There's no carve out. Hmm. Non nonprofit organizations, uh, pretty much uh, unlike the way we have it here in the United States, where we have rules for we have rules for government agencies, we have rules for healthcare, we have rules for you know uh, financial services. It's not like that in the EU. There's one rule to rule them all, and it's GDPR, and uh, it applies to nonprofits the same. No carve outs. Now, there's a whole bunch of other things I can talk about. Like there are some, you know, if you are a nonprofit, you know, it doesn't say nonprofit, but a, you know, civil society agency, you know, you can consider doing X, Y, Z this way, but that you still have to do uh, the whole GDPR risk assessment and implementation if you are uh, collecting and pro processing any personal data from the EU in the US or outside of the EU. All right. Yeah, there you go. No, uh, uh, no carve outs for, for nonprofits. Uh, you've heard it here. Um, uh, we had a few questions roll in just about uh, actually questions for your DPO course. They would love to be able to get the links. And I'll just say for, for everybody there, I know that we will send a link out in terms of access to some of those training resources that you guys have uh, available through, through creating them in that course in particular. Um, the, the two other things I'll mention there is I know uh, not to steal your thunder at all, Deborah, but uh, the GDPR in a box is a really neat thing that you guys have structured and actually we'll be working with um, one of your program managers to kind of provide some more information to our community about that shortly. And that's uh, providing some access to the resources to smaller businesses. And maybe you can touch quickly on that. Yes, yes. So we have released in the EU, we haven't released our US one yet. Um, we're racing against the clock, but there's only, only so many hours in the day for, <laughs> for me. Um, so we, put to, we, we know that there's a real challenge uh, for small and medium-sized businesses across the United States, right? And um, plenty can't afford consultants and lawyers, and um, plenty of us consultants and lawyers, quite frankly, don't have the bandwidth anyway. Uh, we're, 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 the whole industry is at a standstill right now preparing for GDPR. Um, and so what we wanted to do as we were looking ahead is, is, is create um, the documentation and, and templates and policies and guides for businesses that like they can implement and it will be um you know right out of the box right so we actually created a box called and we're calling the solution gdpr in a box and um, it, it basically will come with all of the you know our templates and everything i just said and uh, guides 
and also a USB key. And so the irony here in our version one of pushing this out into the market because it's needed so much is that we're asking people to take a USB key and stick it into their computer uh, and it's not an encrypted key. And so in advance, I apologize for the irony there, but <laughs> it um, it does have all that info you need. Um, right now you can buy it from our, our EU website that I could, uh, Luke, maybe you could send the link out later. Um, yep. right still working on the finishing touches of the US version. So if you can't wait and you're interested in that and, and you can buy different flavors of it that comes with like two days of consulting around it too, um, then that's uh, then that's great if you need that right away. Um, I'm kind of adding some more information to the US version that kind of explains how it fits more into US businesses, uh, kind of using a little more US language so it makes it Mm -hmm. uh, more accessible to this market. Um, that stay tuned. That's coming out shortly. I'm um, going to be throwing up a splash page this week for like, you know, coming soon. Um, so hopefully, uh, we can add. You know, we can reference that link in in this uh, webinar sure. when you send it out. Yeah, and I want to give uh, give a shout out credit to Mark on the line. He's been uh, providing uh, links to any of the ones that we we mentioned. So he has a link to the Deloitte study, as well as uh, even IAPP.org, and so we can provide that and some follow up emails awesome. or, or information or the follow up blog post for sure and uh, teaser as well in terms of GDPR related content. We do have a. Uh, a variety of resources available on HackerOne.com. We even have a, a GDPR tag on our blog, so you can kind of see what we've written and published there. The most recent one uh, we authored was called GDPR, Let's Kill the FUD. Uh, let's, let's kill the fear, uncertainty, and doubts, and kind of look to the practical applications and what the purpose of, of all of that is. Um, it's 11 o'clock here in Pacific time, right at the top of the hour. Um, last question is, does that GDPR in a box apply to Canada? So GDPR in a box actually just applies to EU. Federal. Um, so if anything, um, I am not, uh, it's not applying to Pipeta and um, Castle and other Canadian rules, but I, I think you can probably purchase the U. You can purchase, I suggest you purchase the US one. Um, and I think it'll be the most, more helpful than the EU one. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind waiting a little bit, but if, if you can't wait, I could always just give you the updated version you know what, if you wanted to buy the EU version, I'll make this promise today as a director of the company that I will make sure you get a soft copy of any of the updated US versions um, once they get released, just so that we don't waste any you know, okay. time with the material. Great. Well, we want to be respectful of your time as well as everybody else's. And I do want to just uh, thank you profusely for uh, sharing your knowledge and, and joining us. I think even just from the questions and the attendance, uh, we know this is a really important topic. Uh, really interesting area, and uh, again, just appreciate you sharing your, your thoughts that way. Look forward to even some of the follow-up information to dive into uh, where some of these questions might lead us in some follow-up resources. Obviously, uh, your uh, contact information is there. If you'd love to connect, uh, Hacker One, obviously, on Twitter, and, and um, uh, our, our blog as well, you can check it out. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's going to wrap it up. So any, any final words, Deborah, for our listeners? Uh, final words is um, we're all in this together. Don't uh, I know it feels like the sky is falling, but um, you know there's it's 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 not um, the enforcement isn't coming after you right away. I think what you really want to focus first on is um, you're you want to be able to still get cyber insurance uh, and meet all the requirements for that. And there's all going to be all these GDPR requirements in there in order to be able to get your cyber breach insurance. So you definitely want to get your, your GDPR house in order. Um, but you're also going, might run into some issues in contracting with large companies who already got their GDPR house in order and is asking for all these agreements and, you know, assurance. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you need help, feel free to reach out. Um, glad to point you to resources that might be helpful. Um, also glad to, you know, advise you in any way you need, but, um, you know, just stay calm and know that this uh, this is an evolving field right now. Those, those are my last words, I guess. So we, we need a final slide that says stay calm and carry on. GDPR is uh, all be okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Devil, thank you so much for today and um, have a good day, everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye.